welcome to Access Rhode Island. My name is Kate Brewster, and I'm the Executive Director of the Economic Progress Institute and host of this week's program. My guest this week is Sandra Powell, the Director of the Rhode Island Department of Human Services and former Director of the Rhode Island Department of Labor and Training. Welcome, Sandra, and thank you so much for being here. I know you're a very, very, very busy woman. Okay, thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it. Well, I'm thrilled to have you. I wanted to start the show by talking about you, because you have a great story about um, public service in Rhode Island. You. Um, started in state government years ago and actually became the Department of, uh, Director of the Department of Labor and Training and now Human Services. Can you just tell us a little bit about that sure. journey? Sure, oh, I'd be happy to. Uh, I'm from Rhode Island. I grew up in Providence and my whole family is there and I went to classical, yay classical. <laughs> and I left the state. Uh, I went to college at Princeton and I came back and I really wasn't certain that I wanted to join state government. But uh, my mom worked for, at that time, the Department of Employment Security, and mm -hmm. she urged me. So after a number of years, probably about six years to be exact, I applied, and, and I was accepted to the agency. But I started out on the front line. I started out as an employment interviewer. And I always, always think back and talk about those days because they connected me with the reason, the clients, the people, the reason why we all do what we do in state government. There are people who have a need, sometimes it's lifelong, sometimes it's a moment in time. And I think that we're very uh, fortunate and blessed in many ways to be able to serve them. So I started out uh, helping people look for work. I saw displaced workers. Uh, back in the time when manufacturing, this was back in the late 80s, manufacturing was, was losing some of the tra traditional jobs that have been part of Rhode Island's mm -hmm. you know, economic fabric. Um, so we saw many displaced workers, and we worked to help them get new skills and find employment in the, what was a changing economy. Is it still changing today? We also saw um, single parents. I always remember one of the stories of a mom who was on, at the time it was called AFC, AFDC, right. Aid to Family with Dependent Children, who um, was really just dedicated to being able to stand on her own two feet and, and find employment and live the life she wanted to live. And the programs that existed then were, um, were good, but left a few barriers. For instance, once you found a job, you lost every bit of support that you had to help you to transition. And I always remember her story because uh, she had a child who got a very normal childhood illness and she had to be out of work for a couple of days and the employer fired her. Mm -hmm. So she didn't have some of the backup child care when we come from robust families, things that we take for granted. And I remember her coming back to see me and how disappointed she was because she had worked very, very hard for months to get the skills and to really push herself forward. But anyway, I, I carry those stories with me. I moved up uh, in the Department of Labor and Training under uh, you know, progressively senior uh, positions. And, uh, and about 17 years in, I became the director of the agency. Uh, and that was interesting because it was six months before we went into recession. Right. <laughs> so interesting is a yeah. nice word. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a very challenging three years. Um, we worked really hard to try to uh, turn around at that point, which was the biggest crisis, which was unemployment and getting benefits to people. Right in a timely way it was challenging in many ways, but, but I can say this for sure. The people at that agency, the people who worked in UI, never lost their dedication mm -hmm. to try to provide services to Rhode Island in timely ways. And there's still some challenges going on today. I talked to Director Fogarty, but he's leading it well. Mm -hmm. and, and again, the goal is to serve Rhode Islanders uh, in an effective and, and uh, customer service focused ways. Well, and you did a great job for those many years that you were there and leading the agency in a very challenging time, as you said. Mm -hmm. Now you're in a department that, um, mm -hmm. along with you know the same as Department of Labor and Training, has touched literally hundreds of thousands Absolutely. of lives in Rhode Island, and oftentimes when people are in need of some help. Um, you, the Department of Human Services provides services to people from birth to death, Absolutely. literally. Absolutely. Um, tell us about some of the programs that DHS, Human Services, sure. administers. Sure, um, sure. Well, I've been at the Department of Human Services for about 20, 21 months now. Um, one of the things I can say, I'll just speak personally for a moment, is that I found there often many of the same dedicated type people who work to provide good services to Rhode Islanders. So that was good because I'd spent my whole career at 
DLT, so I learned that. But anyway, the services that the department provides, as you say, go from birth to life. We do eligibility for a multitude of programs and policies. So we provide benefits like SNAP, Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, known, formerly known as food stamps. We do Medicaid programs, Right Care, Right Share, which help people with health insurance and or premium support if they're working. We also do long-term care. We do a program uh, that's called GPA, which is for people who um, have some type of uh, disability that prevents them from working, have almost no resources, a very small amount of money, and oftentimes they're applying for SSI or SSDI, so it provides them some income while they're trying to do that. We have also um, a low-income child assistance program for working Rhode Islanders to help provide support for child care, and that's, uh, again, according to income, and many of our programs are, are income-driven or means-tested, as we like to call them. <laughs> Um, we also have uh, programs uh, such as TANF. So I talked about AFDC, which is what it was called 20-something years ago. Today it's TANF, Temporary Assistance to Needy Families. And which again, more people know as welfare. As I welfare, mean, yes, right. absolutely. Cash welfare, assistance. Right, cash assistance. And again, with the goal of helping to transition people to uh, self-sufficiency, although right. I I think I hear that's a very old-fashioned way of putting it. But <laughs> <laughs> um, we also have... Um, uh, other parts of the agency, we are now have the uh, what used to be the Department of Elderly Affairs. It's the Division of Elderly Affairs. Um, we have the Office of Rehabilitation Services. So we do uh, quite a bit of work for people with disabilities and helping them uh, enter and engage in uh, work with uh, varying supports. We also have the Veterans Affairs uh, Division, which includes the uh, State Veterans <coughs> Home in Bristol, which has a bond issue that's uh, up for um, a vote on uh, in November. And we also operate the Veterans Cemetery, and we're going to be engaged in further outreach services, something the governor is very dedicated mm -hmm. to. Um, we also have, um, we're going to have the LIHEAP program, which is low uh, income heating and energy assistance program mm -hmm. that is transitioning to the agency from the Department of Administration. And I feel like I've probably forgotten one Just or a two. short list of responsibilities that your, <laughs> and programs that your agency, oh my goodness, it's quite a bit. Um, let's talk about one of the programs that has been helping uh, families, especially in the wake sure. of the downturn. I mean, you came into the Department of Labor and Training mm -hmm. at the beginning of the recession. Now you're at the Department of Human Services. Um, mm -hmm. While the recession may be over, Rhode Island still suffering Absolutely. extraordinary unemployment. Absolutely. People have, are working fewer hours at lower wages. So SNAP, which is formerly known as Food Stamps, um, is one of the programs mm -hmm. that we've heard a lot about, and we've sure. seen some real um, increases in enrollment. Can you talk a little bit about SNAP, how it helps sure. families, what the state has experienced? Sure. Well, right now, SNAP has more than 98,000 uh, households that receive SNAP benefits. And as you mentioned, Kate, there's really been a great increase in SNAP assistance over the last several years. And that's been driven by a lot of factors. Mm -hmm. As I said, it's means tested. So a number of people who are in the SNAP program, which people don't often realize, are people who are working, mm -hmm. right? So we have Absolutely. people who are displaced. Uh, about a third of our SNAP households are seniors. So mm -hmm. we have seniors on fixed income. But again, it supplements a family's food and nutrition assistance. Mm -hmm. The program has increased by more than 135% over the last two three years right. um, and there have been a lot of efforts that have uh, taken place in order to do that we've tried to streamline the department's trying to streamline the application I re actually remember when I was at DLT uh, being approached by a group who wanted me to help change the application it was more than 20 pages mm -hmm. so again lots of questions and lots of means testing to figure out what people are in fact eligible for something that's very important about SNAP sometimes people in a sense, deselect themselves. They mm -hmm. say, oh, I don't think I'd be eligible. Mm -hmm. But if someone thinks they might be eligible or they need help with food, they really should contact the department and actually try and see if they might be eligible. Mm -hmm. Because that food assistance can be very low. It could be as low as $10 a month, or it could be much higher depending on the size of the, uh, the household and the family's mm -hmm. income. And the uh, application is downloadable at our website, www.dhs.ri.gov. But generally speaking, again, there's been quite an increase in SNAP utilization, again, to really help people have um, meet their baseline food assistance needs. Um, one of the other things that you hear about SNAP, I didn't ask the question, but I think oh, you may have, <laughs> which is the whole issue of integrity. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a huge issue. You hear that quite a bit uh, as uh, the program is spoken about in some of the um, human services or social assistance programs. So one of the things I can say is that under Governor Chafee's administration, he's very dedicated to making sure that we maintain 
good integrity for the programs because we want to make sure the programs are there for the people who need them, mm -hmm. that they're maintained and they help those who should be helped. Mm -hmm. And if people are getting the program and they shouldn't be, then obviously it's something we'd all be concerned with. But people who are in the SNAP program, again, are people who are Rhode Islanders, many many hurt by the recession, and need some assistance at this time. And I think it's important to know that there, there's so little assistance with housing, for example, right. that that often chews up so much of a person or a household's um, income right. that SNAP benefits can really help fill in with the food, um, other programs can help with specific with specific budget areas and households. That's yeah, right. exactly. basic needs. That's right. That's great. Well, a, a couple other um, programs that are really we know mm -hmm. are very important to low income families are child care assistance yes. and uh, right care health insurance. Right. And as the mother of two and four year olds, I know how expensive child care is. Um, and these are two of the bigger programs probably that the agency runs. Can you tell us a little bit about them and how they really help close the gap sure. between earnings and expenses for sure. families? Absolutely. Well, as I look in, again, for low-income child care, we have about 6,700 families, more than 12,500 children mm -hmm. who are receiving the benefit of low-income child care. And as you mentioned, it's something that helps to offset the cost of child care for low-income working families so they can stay in the workforce. Right. And I think that's something we all want. We want people to be able to work and work as much as they can. Now, sometimes there are some issues, and it's been talked about quite a bit. Um, the low-income child care has a certain cliff effect. Um, so if you earn a certain number of dollars more than uh, the maximum that you can, you lose all support. And there's a lot of conversation going on about that. But generally speaking, again, the purpose of the program is to help supplement people's income so that they can afford to stay at work. And families contribute to the cost of child care. Absolutely. They, they pay co-pays and what Absolutely. Not. Absolutely. You're right. And again, Right Care, Right Share, similarly, um, what the programs, or at least one of the programs, again, is very similar, as you said. It offers to offset the premium of working families so right. that they can, again, f afford um, health, in health insurance while they're at work. Right. Which we know is so important to the health of children and their families and their parents. Right. And right. to be able to get to work. Right. Um, and, I, and I think I'm um, not citing any studies here, but there certainly is a lot of information about the importance to the child and their long-term development in terms of getting very good health care at a young age as they move into school and all the other things that we want children to do to be successful and for families to be successful. And speaking of that, um, let me just touch on for a moment that the state was actually one of few that received two Race to the Top yeah. awards. Um, one was for early childhood education and trying to make sure that those opportunities Absolutely. for kids are, are quality um, experiences. Can you talk a little bit about sure. the role of the department and what you hope to achieve with that? Absolutely. Um, the lead agency for the Race to the Top 2 Early Learning Challenge Grant, as it's called, uh, separating it from the first, is the Department of Education. And that makes sense because obviously the recipient of the first Race to the Top grant, but it really is a collaborative effort because, as you mentioned, we talked early child care uh, is, is uh, approved um, eligibility for families um, and payments to providers happen through the Department of uh, Human Services. And also with some of our funding, we had set aside money for a number of years to improve quality. So the Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge 2 grant allows us to really spread quality throughout many of the child care providers so that we can make certain that children are ready to enter school more ready. So there are lots of incentives and support. It'll be an ongoing process. It's governed through the Early Learning Council, mm -hmm. uh, which is co-chaired by Elizabeth Burke Bryant and Commissioner Giss. So we certainly send Commissioner Giss our best at this time. Um, but the Department of Human Services is responsible for about half of the uh, Race wow. to the Top 2 grant and making sure that we're working specifically in a couple of areas. One is professional development. Mm -hmm. Hear a lot about um, in order to improve outcomes for children, we have to support early childhood educators. So right. we have to do that. And again, the issue of quality in uh, the early childhood arena is something that's important. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention a couple of my other state partners at DCYF, which does licensing, they're a huge component. And also the Department of Health plays a role. And also uh, EOHHS, which stands for the Executive Office of Health and Human Services. They've really become the administrative agency for uh, the Medicaid program. So we do eligibility for Medicaid. They do the administrative piece. 
and they also have the early intervention program for children with disabilities mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. making sure they get the right start, so to speak. So there are many, many components to uh, the Race to the Top 2 Early Learning Challenge Grant, but it is a huge win for Rhode Island. It can make a difference for years to come for our our children and families and in that uh, part of our uh, economic fabric. Which is terrific. So we look forward to monitoring the progress yeah, on that front absolutely. and the other Race to the Top grant, which I know uh, we are very excited to receive as well with the public absolutely. education system. So that's terrific. Well, and Rhode Island was actually fortunate to receive another grant yes. from the Ford Foundation for absolutely. a project called Streamlining Access Strengthening Families. Um, I'm not which, sure I could have said that. <laughs> well, you have a, I, I know there's several names for it. Um, but I understand understand that this is really about making sure that families um, are able to meet their basic needs and have access to the programs you spoke about. You mentioned sure. earlier um, SNAP, you know, right. has had a 20-page application. So tell us, um, when you look at families that might need child care and right care and SNAP benefits maybe, um, what happens now when they apply and try to enroll and what do you hope will happen in the future? What's the goal of all of this? Well, right now uh, it, it's difficult for families, uh, individuals, and it's actually difficult for the agency. We have a, a, a huge system, huge uh, computer system that we use to put information in in order to make benefit determinations, to give notices to people, but unfortunately it was built more than 25 years ago and it was state of the art at the time. <laughs> Can um, you imagine 25 the years the ago? Then. But um, it really took our programs and put them into silos. And what happened is the workforce was structured in silos, but the individuals and families who we serve are not siloed. Right. Their needs are sometimes multidimensional and multifaceted. So what happens now is you, if you came in and you needed SNAP benefits and you needed right care benefits, you would go see, you'd come maybe to the same office, have different appointments, see different people at different times, even though you're really one person or, or one family unit. So what the Ford Foundation grant is helping us to do, and about six other states, is fi to figure out ways to streamline how we deliver those services, work support services to families uh, and individuals. How do we take these these uh, decades old systems and braid them together in a way that makes sense for the individuals, for our clients, our customers, and for the agency and for our workers and our workforce. So it's really a lot of work because you need to do this while you're delivering services. Right. You can't stop and take a few months and say, okay, right. we're gonna turn everything off, we're gonna fix it. No, we have to make sure we continue to deliver services, but we want to work to make sure that we transform. We take this opportunity. The Ford Foundation, along with the other states, are really providing us some very targeted support and technical assistance, um, some real heavy lifts, some great thinking, some great challenges for us. Um, so we have a grant of about $1.2 million for three years. It allows us to bring in technical assistance, and it also happens to marry very well with the Affordable Care Act, which is another um, huge initiative that the state of Rhode Island is undertaking, and DHS has a strong part. Right, and before we go there, because that's a big piece of what's coming around, coming down the bend, um, I just want to mention that, you know, you've got, as you said, families who are working, so oftentimes yes. they can't get that's to the offices point. for these multiple appointments, and great point. there are so many other computer systems now that are available Absolutely. to be able to pull information from um, without asking people to hand deliver uh, stuff that, you know, you can get online and from other departments, Absolutely. so it's just key. Um, um, that, that this is a great time to be doing this. And, and Kate, thank you. And I also probably should mention, you know, as we talk about the recession and we talk about government and not just in Rhode Island, but obviously in a time of recession, um, there is, there's downsizing that's taking place right. in government. You know, there are fewer resources, but the needs, especially in a department like human services, right. actually may be great. They are greater than they have been in past times. So one of our charges is to figure out how to do the work we need to do with the resources, the more constrained resources that we all face today. And again, that's where the Ford Foundation comes in. Our systems were set up back in uh, 2008. We probably lost about a third of our frontline staff. Wow. So our systems were set up for, you know, this ample number of staff, and but we don't have that anymore. So the strains are being felt not just by the DHS staff members, but also by our clients. Right. So we really have to work hard to do a better job and to transform how we provide those services. A lot of people with good hearts, but we have to make sure that we're serving people, in, as you said, 
in ways that meet the 21st century. Right. It's, it's so incredible. And despite what people think, Rhode Island actually shed some of the largest numbers of, um, as a share of employment of public sector jobs uh, over the past several years. Oh. So we've really taken a big hit in that area. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you've got Kate workers I know who have hundreds of cases yeah, and absolutely. it's just unmanageable. And, and so what you're doing Not is so important. Ways. You right. You can't do it well and efficiently. Right. So let's talk about healthcare reform. Okay. Um, we know that um, things are going to change. You know, you've got all these changes yes. happening now and, and by 2014 right. you're going to be serving even more people uh, when the Affordable Care Act, as you said, or health care reform is implemented in Rhode Island. Sure. Can you just tell Rhode Islanders what, what will be some of the big changes in terms of who will be eligible um, for programs now that haven't been? And give us a kind of a 20,000 foot look at sure. what this will be like for sure. folks. Well, uh, a few significant changes. One has to do with the, the requirement, actually, that people have health care. So that's one of the biggest right. changes, of course. <laughs> and then how, do you, how does that work? How does that happen? So one of the first rollouts of the Affordable Care Act in Rhode Island is going to be a health portal or health exchange. So I should just mention for a moment some of the partners who are in this huge effort. I mentioned earlier EOHHS, or Executive Office of Health and Human Services, and that's overseen by Secretary Co uh, Stephen Costantino. We have the Health Exchange. The director there is Christy Ferguson, who has deep roots in Rhode Island. She used to be the director of your the job. Human <laughs> Services, exactly, <laughs> and is considered to be an expert in many regards in terms of health reform. We have Chris Kohler at the Office of the Health Insurance mm -hmm. Commissioner, again, because there's a lot of to do about buying health right. insurance. Uh, Elena Nicolello, who works for Secretary Costantino, but she's the state Medicaid director, which is really important. Um, we have the Department of Administration. There's, there's a lot of purchasing and different things that have to happen. Um, and we also have, of course, always the governor's office and lieutenant governors. Well, the Lieutenant Governor, Lieutenant Governor Roberts has been in the forefront of yep. health reform for many, many years. Right. So it's a huge, again, collaborative effort in order to bring health, and, uh, health reform to Rhode Island, health insurance. So again, talking about those changes from a higher view, one of the things that will happen is that people will have the option to figure out what plan, what do they want to purchase. Mm -hmm. And also, what might they be eligible for? They may be eligible for uh, no cost to them, which is the Medicaid program, or they may have a premium assistance, we talked about that in some of mm -hmm. the other programs, or if they don't qualify for any, they would be paying for health insurance themselves. And also there are businesses and small businesses right. who have the opportunity to access health insurance. But again, in 2014, one of the most sizable changes is that those childless adults who have never been eligible for any uh, public assistance in health insurance will become eligible for the first time. Right. And that really makes a change. The other thing that's significant is information. We need to make sure that we get to Rhode Islanders information about what is it that they need to do? Where do they need to go? What information will they have? All of those conversations are taking place. The role of the Department of Human Services will change in some ways, and we're still talking about that and figuring out what will that look like. But again, at the end of the day, it's about providing access to health insurance for all Rhode Islanders, making sure people know what they're eligible for. And then the other thing that's really significant is that we are also creating, when we talked about the um, Ford plant, right and this change in streamlining and making sure we're in the 21st century. Well, the other thing we want to do is once people actually go to the portal and put in information to figure out where they need to go with health insurance, they will be asked if they want information about other benefits. And so again, rather than going back and forth to an office five times bringing information for this, for that, we're, we're hoping to have a process where people can have almost like a one-stop shop. They can put information, but they are in the driver's seat. Right. They get to say, yes, I'd like more. In I'd like to know more about this. Yes, I'm interested. So it really is a, a uh, enormous opportunity for state. It is a game changer in the state of Rhode Island in terms of how we deliver benefits. Well, it's very exciting. And as you mentioned earlier, so many people don't realize that they can be working and Absolutely. access SNAP benefits or access right care health Absolutely. insurance. They have no idea. I mean, Absolutely. I've worked for those programs for years before Absolutely. my current yes. job, and people are just amazed. Right. Um, and so it's, it's. I can say before I came to DHS, <laughs> I was amazed. <laughs> <laughs> 
I right. spent the 20 years at Department of Labor and Training deeply immersed in that. So right. you do learn. In, and I think if I'm in state government and I'm still learning, right. if you're not connected with government, it really can be almost like a maze. Right. And it's our job to break down those walls and make sure people understand and have access to information that's understandable to them, not just to us. Right. And it's yeah. hard enough for us to understand, Absolutely. as you just said. Absolutely. So it's really, it's, it is, as you said, a very exciting time. You described uh, um, terrific leaders who are yeah, leading this absolutely. effort. Um, so there really is a chance that Rhode Island will be out in the forefront. We, we really have been, we have been in exactly. trying to, to get this up and running. And I know there absolutely. are call centers being created and yes. all kinds of things that are happening right now as we speak um, in anticipation of this. So we appreciate your leadership. Yeah. Let's just take the last few minutes to talk about, um, you've spent all these years in, in public service. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the challenges, uh, unique challenges, in trying to make change? I mean, you sure. getting a 25 year old computer system out of the government can be a difficult task. Um, but beyond that, what, what are some of the challenges with change in the public sector? Well, I think that some of the challenges really have to do with, I'll go back a few years, again, when the uh, state uh, lost you know, a number of staff who uh, retired. And so you have um, a lot of what we might call a brain drain. And mm -hmm. I know sometimes people think that there's not a lot of good brains in state government, but there are. There, there are, are good there people absolutely who are. really know deeply their programs. And those are many of the people who left. Right. So one of the important jobs is to reestablish, to, to reestablish the baseline, mm -hmm. make sure that we're all doing the things that we need to do. We have many, many stakeholders that we are responsible mm -hmm. to answer to, from our members in the General Assembly to our federal partners, mm -hmm. the governor, our, our, um, cl the clients that we serve, the public at large, the taxpayers. Right. So we really need to make sure we establish a great baseline. And then the issue is transformation really with a transparency. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's really important. And then going back to one of the things I know that's important for the governor, and is also trying to do it with good customer service. Right. So we have people, as you mentioned, uh, uh, you was talking about DHS specifically. Um, for instance, in the SNAP program, we know we have people with hundreds and hundreds of cases, mm -hmm. um, you know, more than a thousand cases. Oof. They're trying to do a good job and we're trying to give them the tools to do the mm -hmm. job well, but it is a challenge. It's really a challenge. So, but we all work hard at it every single day. Uh, we, we do not take it lightly uh, what we're given. As I said, it really is an opportunity. It's a blessing in many ways to get to try to do good for people. That is really what we should be doing. And we try to do it in ways that are cost effective. We keep the taxpayer in mind. And that's terrific. And last minute. Let's um, talk about something that taxpayers can do for people, which is the um, vote for the bond that is up for the oh. veterans. So if you want to take a minute and end the show with a commercial for that? Sure, I can talk about that. <laughs> well, one of the things that's before the voters is a bond for a uh, vote or a decision whether or not there should be a new veterans home. So we know that this is, uh, you know, the country is in a time of war, and I don't think that any of us can uh, not recognize the sacrifice of the men and women who are out there defending us. And and uh, we know that their needs will change mm -hmm. in the coming years. Uh, the Veterans Home serves people well today, but we know there will be future needs. We know the injuries are different. Sometimes the time uh, that people will need uh, for assistance might be longer. So that's what we Do we know which question about. it is? I believe it's four. Question four. I believe so, it's four. Sandra, thank you so much for being here. We could go on and on. Um, there are thank so many welcome. things that you do, and you have been such a great leader. I want to thank oh, you, thank you uh, much, for your please. service and for being here tonight. Thank and you. Vote for question four. Thank you. See you next time.